Good afternoon. I'm David Rubin, the Brown Foundation Curator of Contemporary Art here at Sama, and it's my pleasure to introduce Walton Ford today. His work is in many um, distinguished collections, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, Princeton University Art Museum, the Wadsworth Athen Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, he's been in numerous exhibitions. Uh, some of the major ones occurred at Bowdoin College Museum of Art, the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art, the Whitney Museum of Art at Champion, and the Forum for Contemporary Art in St. Louis. He has also received uh, numerous pre prestigious awards, including a fellowship from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and grants from the Pollock Krasner Foundation and the New York Foundation for the Arts. So welcome, Walton. Thank you very <laughs> much for having me. Thank you, everyone here. So. <laughs> San Antonio <laughs> taking pretty good care of me. OK, so let's, let's start. Um, you were born in uh, New York City. You were raised, I guess, in Well, West, actually, West no, Chester. I was born I mean, in city, Westchester, West yeah, Chester. just outside of New York. Just outside of New York. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, um, you were raised uh, in that area and? Oh, dear, look at that. <laughs> As a young, young artist, yeah. um, uh, uh, you were already uh, sort of a, uh, practicing your, what became your life's work. Uh, tell us about the drawing you're making in, in that picture there. Yeah, I was uh, in that photo. All my relatives were Southern, uh, except for my, you know, and my mom and dad, they, they, they moved us up north before I was born. At, the rest of the family had plantation roots that go back, you know, centuries. And, this, I'm actually in Hopewell, Virginia in this picture at Coggins Point on the James River, and those are my cousins. And uh, there was a lot of, it was duck hunting season. <laughs> and um, I was drawing a pintail duck. Were you drawing from memory? Or mm, had you taken a it photograph? It looks like, or? I can't tell if there's open books. There might be an Audubon book on that table somewhere. So you were already looking at Audubon. Oh, definitely. Uh -huh. And uh, they had, uh, re uh, they had uh, Audubons up in this house. This is a kind of classic white columns, you know, my, my, un Mountain. yeah, my <laughs> uncle's house yeah. in Hopewell, he was the mayor of Hopewell, he built the Richmond airport, he's like this sort of big shot down there, you know, so he had one of those houses that you drive up to, the, you know, and the columns, and there's hunting dogs everywhere, and uh, the gun room, and, and pictures of ducks flying over the marsh, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of what I'm doing, is the duck picture for my uncle Nux. And, was uh, that sort of a favorite subject at that point? Any, any kind of drawing. animal subject. Mm -hmm. If you grow up in this environment, it might be the only art you've ever seen for a long time. It might be sport art. And I actually loved it. I had no problem. You know, I wanted to make those objects. Um, uh, but early on, actually, I was interested also in comics, uh, comic books, and interested in movies like King Kong. Mm -hmm. where the sort of savagery of the wild, which was the opposite of the suburban life that I grew up in. Um, we have another early drawing of yours here. Well, I was about that age when I drew yeah. this. And um, where but, did that come from? Did you, uh, again, do you think you were looking at a picture in a book? I probably was looking at a source, uh, yeah, but... Um, I bet you he wasn't growling quite like that. I was going to say, he looks pretty, pretty ferocious. So I was always interested in, in, in this sort of aggression in nature and this sort of, uh, yeah, in some idea of savagery. And again, this would be informed by that whole King Kong aspect of my interest in natural history. It wouldn't have been uh, that I wanted to make uh, traditional natural history images even from a really early age. I think they started to have a weird edge to them. So did you really kind of recognize, even at age nine, that being an artist was something you aspired to? I already knew that's what I was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know any nine-year-olds that could draw like that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I still don't. <laughs> so, so before we get into your, your mature work, which is mostly what we're going to look at today, we'll leave this ferocious image up, because I want people to remember the, the position of the mouth in particular. Yeah, but, I know. It's funny. But um, you kind of, it wasn't an overnight Road. I mean, you went to school at RISD, Rhode Island right. School of Design. Well, I had a friend come up to me recently at an opening. I'm 47 years old, and he'd seen this drawing. He'd only seen it, or a lot of my other early drawings. And he said, well, I guess if you do the same thing for 40 years, you might get kind of good <laughs> at it. And it's like, I kind of hope I got warmed up a little, you know, after well, well, 40 years. Well, tell us years. a little bit about your experience at RISD and what kind of 
art you were making. I know you don't want to show any of it, but you can at least tell us what you were doing. Yeah, I know. David's like, I want to bring you right through your evolution <laughs> as an artist. And I said, that's great, except that I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> that was being a little difficult, I guess. But um, I, I, I went through, it was a very traditional art program. I, I already arrived at, at, at 18, kind of already knowing how to draw a little bit. Um, um, so you, your freshman year, it's like boot camp. You know, you draw the model and you learn color theory. And I think my work looked like student work for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up going into the film department because I, I felt like I already knew how to draw and I already knew how to paint. And they weren't going to teach me anything. And, and I was an arrogant kid, you know. And uh, uh, that's what arrogant kids do. And then, and, but what I found out when I went into the film department is that I was a, a really terrible filmmaker. I, I didn't know it. I, I had no aptitude for the machinery. I couldn't cut the film. I didn't want to be in the cutting room. The kids that were good filmmakers love this stuff. And they're talking about the aperture. And they're talking about the shot they got and lighting it. And I'm like, I went into the wrong department. I had stories to tell. Were but you, I didn't want to, I, I realized I couldn't tell them that way. And it was my own hubris. You have, this is a message to art students, you often have contempt for the thing that you're really good at. And the thing I was really good at is this. Did you abandon drawing or did you continue drawing? Uh, well, that was the thing is I drew the entire time at was RISD and I had painting shows as well in mm -hmm. the coffee shops in Providence. And a lot of the painting teachers were like, why the hell didn't you go into the painting department? And I said, well, you know, I couldn't say what I thought, which was, you have nothing to teach me. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't. I said, well, I, you know, I, I thought I wanted stories to tell. And narrative painting, this is 1978, I went to art school. Narrative painting wasn't cool, you know. And the people that were starting to do it were like Eric Fischel, mm -hmm. came to our school. He was a young man, and he was just breaking into the deal. And he was not a made guy at that point at all. And he came and gave a lecture, and that actually had some impact on me. I was like, cool, he's telling stories. I didn't like his paintings at all. Mm -hmm. But I thought that it was cool that he told stories and that he was trendy. And then, and then you had, like, uh, uh, what's his face come? William Wegman. With, and he mm -hmm. came without all the greeting cards, you know. And he, he, at that point, was making these weird videos. Right. So, but it made me realize there was narrative in it. It was funny. And it was getting acceptance. So I, I got a little inkling, I think, of encouragement that way. But then my senior year, I went to Italy. And I saw frescoes. And I saw narrative painting. And I saw what human beings are capable of, which is what happens when you go to Italy. You think you know here in the United States. But you've got to go there if you're an artist. And you've got to see what the difference is. This, OK. If you look at the way our society is structured, money-wise or whatever, all the money goes into what? Like corporate investigation and, and, and defense and these things. And so that those things, like weapon systems, you know, the predator or whatever, when you pour money into something, it's beautiful. The things, the beautiful things we're making now are not cathedrals and they're not frescoes. They're like weapon systems, probably. And, my and computer design, like the Mac laptop, you know, these things are exquisite for a reason because all of the uh, resources of a culture are headed in one direction. When you go to Italy, you see all the resources of that society were headed towards building churches to glorify the church, and, and all the resources were going into paying artists to come up with, with things that would glorify their patrons. And so you're in a place where the ultimate artistic achievement is made possible. And by was, the entire society. And there was one artist in particular from the early Renaissance, right, who just blew you away. Yeah, Giotto, you know? Because yeah. it's the cleanest, like it's big, huge comic strips. I'd already knew the language. I already knew, like, it's narrative, it's sequential, it's emotional, it's over the top, it, but it's restrained as well because the high Renaissance, it gets to be a bit much. The thing, when you go to see the Sistine Chapel, it's amazing, but overall, as a work of art, it doesn't work. It's like, it's just like, oh, you know, it's, it's like surf and turf. It's too much, man. You don't need all of this stuff. <laughs> it starts to get to be tacky. It's like too many calories, you know? So like Michelangelo, you need him in small doses. He's like, it's like conversation with me. You don't want to have it all day long. <laughs> so, so, so the best thing of Michelangelo's in Rome is not the Sistine Chapel, it's the Moses. You go and see it, and you're all alone, and you get to look at what, why is this guy a genius? Why is this so beautiful? And, and actually, what's the answer? What's the answer? 
to that. Yeah. When you look at the Moses God, it that sculpture is is how can I say it? It, it is he makes visible the invisible in that thing. That sculpture, the power of spiritual enlightenment is personified. So how do you how do you make a visual image out of rock that says what happens to somebody when they become completely enlightened spiritually? <laughs> what does that look like? And when you look at that sculpture, it's like somehow the answer. It's an unbelievable affirmation of of that, of like how do you make something, how do you give visual metaphors for things that you can't see, that, that have no visual equivalent? And that's what a lot of Renaissance artists did. Mm -hmm. And they had to do it within a very narrow set of Bible stories. You know, you, this, these are your approved subjects. Otherwise, you go to the stake, you know? Right. You, you don't screw around with these subjects. Exactly. You, so, so you obviously were truly inspired, and you, you, did, then you, you got out of RISD, you finished RISD, right. and you decided to do what most artists do from RISD. They go to a big city like New York to become, make it as an artist. Right. Yeah. right. What was that like? Did, you didn't make it overnight. <laughs> sure as hell not, yeah. Tell so I arrived in New York yeah. City, I graduated in 1982, mm -hmm. and uh, my dad was an executive at Time Inc., but he left home when I was like 11 and hit the road. So I was raised by basically a single mom who had a high school education, but she's a very elegant woman. And like I said, they all came back from these plantations. So they had a very high, you know, like D-A-R, but broke, you know? <laughs> I like those women. You know, and my, they all, you know, and my grandmother was some kind of classy woman smoking cigarettes and drinking bourbon and telling dirty jokes, but, <laughs> but feeling like she knew Peggy Mitchell who wrote Gone with the Wind, you know, and she knew all these people. And her, her maiden name was Ashley. And it found its way into the book because she was friends with Peggy Mitchell. So those are the stories you hear <laughs> over and over again from the Grand Dame. But that know. kind of feeds into your work eventually, right? Absolutely, because yeah. she's a connection with the Civil War. I mean, they were still pissed off, obviously, about the Civil War. <laughs> and I was a Yankee, kind of, you know. You know, I could still talk right. like my dad if I wanted to. But. So at any rate, <laughs> to kind of move forward in your work now, um, we have one example of your work from the period sort of in between RISD and the work in this show, which, and you know, uh, I first encountered your work over 10 years ago because you were in an exhibition that I think was curated at the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art called Heroic Painting. Right. And this is the kind of work you were doing at that time. Right. And it is, it is heroic, I think. And yeah. tell us about it. What's going on there? And why are you working in the triptych format? I, a lot of people I know are curious about that. Yeah. This was huge. This is as big as anything I ever did, but this, this, when I showed this work, it was a, I would say, pretty much of a flop. Uh, you know, I was the least well-reviewed in that show for some reason. I don't know. This is about 20 feet by 9 feet, and they're oil on wooden panels. And I was looking at Hudson River School landscapes, and I wanted to make alternative Hudson River School landscapes. I wanted to, to tell stories that wouldn't have been included in a traditional Hudson River landscape. The title is Martha. What is now, that Martha, yeah. Martha was the last passenger pigeon. And passenger pigeons were the most numerous bird that ever lived. Right. And the flights of these birds, it took six days to pass overhead. Audubon describes these enormous flights. And this is directly from an Audubon description of, of people hunting the birds. So all the way to your, I guess you're facing it, yeah, all the way to your left, you see Audubon on a bluff with this easel. And he's painting two little passenger pigeons billing and cooing. But from the distance, they're coming in the huge flocks. And as they pass over, between, you know, into this uh, notch and this, in this, in this imaginary American landscape. Uh, uh, they're being fired upon in the extreme right-hand corner by you know, hundreds of gunmen. You know, they slaughtered the passenger pigeon in something like 50 years of constant pressure and effort. Following the flocks, they were pigeon killers. That's what they did. Mm -hmm. They were that people had. And, and these birds were so numerous, they were plowed into fields. They were fed to the hogs. They, it was the cheapest meat. That you could, they were put in barrels and, and, and salt and sent to the cities. Um, later, when there were trains, they put, put them in train cars. The last passenger pigeon, Martha, died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo right. on September 1st right. at 1 p.m. And it's the only extinction in the world where they know everything about it, 
Because every other extinction happens out there. Like, we don't know when the last ivory bill woodpecker died or something. They think there still is one, but there right, isn't. Right. But they, they die somewhere out there somewhere. Nobody knows. But this one fell off her perch, and there was a zookeeper there. So you have it like, extinction, now, you know. <laughs> we win. And, uh, uh, <laughs> you know. You know, so, 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 uh, uh, and they know she was the last one because they had sent a thousand dollar reward for, for, she lived to be 20. And for the, like the last 10 years of her life, they searched the country with a thousand dollar reward for a mate, for anybody who could find another passenger pigeon anywhere. In, yeah, and people were desperately trying to find this bird. A thousand bucks was a lot of money in 1914. So we know that there weren't any more just floating around out there when right. she died. Right. And they froze her in a block of ice, like a 600 block of, a pound block of ice, because you know, we didn't have that much refrigeration. Put her on a boxcar and shipped her to the Smithsonian. In, and as the block melted, that was a conceptual art piece there? I wanted to make. And she stuck, yeah. yeah. I wanted to make a fake passenger pigeon, put it in a 600 pound block of ice, and just leave it in the gallery. And, like, ha and go through the train ride with her. I don't know how many days it would have stayed there. And, but anyhow, that was one idea, but I'm not. So the obviously the, the triptych, that was to add to scale, I presume, in this case, right? This was to add to scale, and it was to make a secular altarpiece about this bird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That she was the last one. You know, I gave her her due. She, she, uh, the, the, the why they don't teach the story of Martha in every elementary school across America, I'll never know. I think that we, I'd rather know this than something about, you know, whatever. Like, you can imagine so many history things that we are supposed to learn. But give me a day with your kids, and I'll teach them all about this stuff. Okay. <laughs> so about the time that I'm depressed. the heroic painting show was, was touring in the late 90s, you started making paintings like this. Mm -hmm. And um, this, was, uh, this was the first one, was it not? This was the first big one. <laughs> the first really large, on this scale. M my wife. We we're still starving artists. We, we had a, a baby, it, 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 and we're living in, in all kinds of, and I was working as a carpenter in New York City, and a wood refinisher, and metal <coughs> shops, and you name it. And she was doing bookkeeping in galleries, and um, she's one of those girls dressed in black that walk around in galleries. And, I, and, you know, and I'm like, I'm like just, just quick picking splinters out of my hand, hoping for something, you know. My, my, my wife got a fellowship to study in India for six months with uh, Fulbright. And um, she was studying tantric temple design and painting Rajasthani meditational diagrams and all these things. And because um, I met her at RISD, she's an artist as well. Um, but in the meet, but by the, between the time that she wrote the grant and sent it in and it went through the Indian bureaucracy and came back to us, um, we had had an infant, you know. And she was one, and uh, uh, but we went anyway, you know, and um, that changed everything for me. I suddenly started to think I wanted to make. I had started making faux Audubons already, little Audubon paintings that just talked about Audubon as being a kind of trippy person to think about, you know, because he was complicated mm -hmm. and he was tortured and he felt unappreciated, and I could relate very strongly to all that. So I'd make the animals act out Audubon's psyche. You know, the animals were acting out fever dreams from his own tortured imagination. I figure if you go out and you shoot like 300, 400 birds in a single day, you probably toss it and turn it a little bit at night, you know. So I'd paint those fever dreams. Okay. But then when I went to India, I had so many moments where I didn't understand what the hell was going on that I wanted to make my artwork about just that. I wanted to make natural history pictures set in the country that I was addressing, like thinking about, mm -hmm. and have the pictures look like they were done by Western naturalists, which I was an amateur version of, but have them full of these stories of cultural misapprehension, of, of, of colonialism. And it didn't all come at once. But, I, but I, this one was, is a history of Vietnam told on the skin of a Vietnamese tiger in the form of silhouettes and quotations all around. It, it, the silhouettes are figures from, from Vietnamese martial history, basically the wars against the Chinese, the French, and the Americans. So what, when people look at this painting, what are they supposed to find there's, in the tiger stripes? They're supposed to find little silhouettes. Mm -hmm. And then the silhouettes, some are recognizable to us and some aren't. 
and then you and then close to those silhouettes, somewhere around the, are quotes from the figures that are depicted, mm -hmm. and it's a timeline of there are many Vietnamese heroines. There are a lot of uh, they have a, a a martial tradition of, of of women in Vietnam where women took up arms and fought as well as men, which was something that surprised our troops. But they'd been doing it against the Chinese forever, you know. It was interesting. I was talking to a Vietnamese person, and they said, we don't resent the Americans at all, or the French, but the Chinese, we really, we, don't, we know they're coming back. So we have to, that's who we're worried about all the time. We're not worried about you guys. You're not coming back. And we're like, yeah, we're not coming back. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about the text, cause, uh, and also about the paper. I mean, these are really interesting aspects of, of the works in this show. Start with the paper. What kind of paper do you use? Well, I buy roll, rolls of water, handmade watercolor paper that, from England that comes through uh, New York Central Art Supply in New York. Mm -hmm. So, and they ha get rolls of this handmade art of handmade paper, 20-yard rolls, but they cut it up and sell it. But I buy the roll before they get around to cutting it up. Mm -hmm. I figured out that, you know, don't cut it up, give it to me whole. So they send me a roll of watercolor paper about like that every. And this is Year about as so. large as the roll, right? No, no, the roll's 20 oh, yards roll. long. Oh, I'm sorry, the roll's much 20 longer. yards long, so I get like quite a few watercolors out okay. of each roll, uh, 10 foot by 5 foot or whatever I'm working on. Okay. And, um, and I can't, I, I wanted to make bigger ones. I started spooling out like 15 feet or 16 feet, and the framer calls me up. It's like, we can't get plexiglass. Even if we could, when you frame something that big, the lip of the frame that holds the plexi starts to, it, like the plexi will bow out and pop out of the frame if you try to pick it up. The whole thing will start torquing unless it, then it becomes so heavy if you make, that you can't hang it on any wall. You know, I'm like, okay, I give up. I made the biggest watercolors possible. And, and, I then, think, and then how do you make them look aged like that? I mop them with this cheap sponge mop from like, you know, true value, you know. And then I, um, do a like Jackson Pollock, you know, mm -hmm. and splatter them and with paint. People say tea, but tea's a stupid idea. Tea's not paint. You can control paint. You know, everybody thinks you put tea on paper, but why would you do that when you have uh, beautiful watercolor paints, you know, that are brown and, and do exactly what you ask them to do? And then all of the writing, as you've already noted, they have something to do with the story and the narrative and the people who are camouflaged within the, in this case, in the tiger stripes. But um, did, in Audubon, there was writing, was there not, in some of his Yeah, books? that's right. Um, a lot of the naturalists, were, when they made their watercolors, they made them in the field in notebooks. And they were not meant to be works of art on their own. They were meant to convey information to the printer, who was then going to publish a book of etchings or lithographs based on these field drawings. So many, many naturalists always had an eye towards publication. And they made notes to their printer. They made notes about the time of day and the conditions in which the bird was shot. They often made notes about if they didn't have time to paint a landscape behind, they would, t they would say, you know, swamp. You know. Uh, Audubon wrote to his printer things like, put in a nice seascape in the background or something. You know, he didn't even draw the seascape. He didn't want to do that. And he had people making plants and animals for him. He was just painting the birds, not plants and animals, plants and backgrounds for him in the field as well filling in the stuff later so that the composition, and he would just cut out a bird and paste it on a page and then paint, indicate that he wanted a branch there of honeysuckle.